Good morning everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Not-for-Profit Sponsorship Trends in 2014. My name is Sakina Vora and I'm the Volunteer Events and Marketing Officer here at Connecting Up. Our speaker today is Julian Moore. Julian is Australasia's foremost not-for-profit sponsorship practitioner specializing in charities, associations and other not-for-profits. He specializes in training, motivating and upskilling boards and staff to improve sponsorship performance. Julian draws on his extensive experience in both Australia and the United Kingdom to deliver sponsorship outcomes for his clients. So before I hand over to Julian, just wanted to go through some housekeeping notes. To those who are new, please feel free to type in your questions in the question box. We will try and make sure to answer all the questions during or at the end of the presentation. If you're facing any technical issues, like if you're having any audio issues or are unable to see the slides, please type in those issues as well and we will get it sorted out for you. This presentation is being recorded, so everyone present will receive an email with a link to the recording and slides by the end of day today. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Julian. Hello everybody and thank you for attending. Uh, I know I've met a few of you already on the uh, Connecting Up tour we've just recently finalized. So today really is about a year in review. What we're trying to do is review what's been happening in sponsorship in the community sector and what's been happening in uh, the trends of sponsorship all the way through to today. Now, we'll kick off with the first question. So the wonderful Sakina who set this up for us has got a nice poll ready for you to answer. And really what we're trying to do is gauge here just the level of sponsorship interest that's been happening within the audience. So if you could answer, what was your largest sponsorship in 2013 slash 14? Yes, uh, we have and about Sakina, 50. has that poll gone out? Oh yes, it has. Uh, we have about 60% who has already uh, voted. We'll just give them a couple of more seconds. So everybody, this is your sponsorship. So this doesn't include donations. It doesn't include fundraising or bequests. It's just corporate partners. And this poll really, the idea of this is just to give us a wonderful sort of uh, guide on what the levels of people receiving. Okay, so uh, I'll close the poll and your other results. About 50% have voted between 0 to 5,000. 30% have voted between 5,000 and 20,000. 10% from 20,000 to 50,000 and 5% 5 each for 50 to 100,000 and 100,000 to 500,000. That's wonderful. That's, that's about the same as what's been happening with uh, the tour itself. So what we're finding is predominantly people are undervaluing what they're able to offer to the corporate partners. Now the reason we're seeing this, it seems to be a case that when we're asking for a value, what we're putting in the cost of implementation rather than the value to the partner. So what we're doing is we're considering if it costs us 10,000 to implement, we're asking a 20,000 ask. Whereas what we should be doing is evaluating how much the partner makes uh, in profit from this partnership and valuing that way. The reason I've started with this is when I come in to work with a client, it, predominantly the lowest amount I've asked in the last six years is $40,000. And 0 to 5,000 can actually cause some challenges in servicing. Asking 0 to 5 means that it's going to be, uh, in some cases, cost prohibitive to deliver the services you want to deliver to the partner. So it's good to kick off and understand uh, the valuation of these. So in the NFP sectors, what are hot right now? I have to say, health and chronic illness is becoming really front of mind at the moment. We're seeing diabetes, asthma, we're seeing all these chronic in illness, and on the health side of things, we're now seeing 
people like Blackmores and uh, Swiss really stepping up in the health sector. So complementary health care and chronic illness are really pushing ahead. The same with families, females, and school-aged children. It's gone away from the uh, sporting, healthy, active lifestyle and moved much more into who can get hold of families, who can get hold of the mother, the children, and particularly uh, children, when we talk about them, we're talking of the uh, 12 to 18-year-old range. Now, we're seeing many individuals looking to push there. All the tech companies are after the families. All the tech companies are after the school-aged children. The health companies and the fitness and sport really come together. But we're seeing a, quite a change in the agricultural department. We're seeing now that agriculture is being pushed primarily by the chemicals. So with the chemicals, this is... Uh, quite a change from what we've ever seen before. So when we talk about agriculture, we obviously are talking about the chemicals for pesticides and not just so forth for the agriculture. But now we're also seeing chemicals come through much more into the, uh, the family side. So you'll all remember just recently the Dulux advert where they painted the Surf Life Saving Club. We're now seeing Dulux looking for other people where they can paint these uh, really prominent buildings so that they stand out and they talk about how they're able to engage with the community that way. Endangered species, we're actually seeing them go from almost nothing, where nobody wanted to align with them, to organizations taking on an endangered species that aligns with their name. And travel and destinations, well, this really comes from the fact that uh, the airlines are now really beginning to re-engage. So with on not so much uh, Qantas, Qantas are only slowly, slowly stepping back into the market. But Air New Zealand, Cathay Pacific, the Emirates, and uh, the um, Singapore Airlines, they're really looking to engage with any events side of things who have a number of people to travel. So these sectors, we're actually seeing really hot topics at the moment. Now, the common mistakes that we're finding, that the people are making, are we're engaging, so we're sending out these proposals, but then there's no follow-up phone calls. I have to say, at the moment, to get hold of the CEO or the brand director or marketing director, roughly you're going to make at least six to eight phone calls to get hold of these people. This isn't because they're ignoring you. This isn't because they uh, don't want to take your phone calls. This is simply a case of their time poor. They travel a huge amount, and we're not the most priority for them. So what we have to do is leave one phone call a week, every week, to ask them just the case, have you seen my proposal, and can we have a discussion? So the failure to make phone calls is just everywhere, and I'm running into it every single client I have. So if you make those phone calls, you will get your responses. Generic offerings. I was sat with two or three corporates uh, a few weeks ago, and we had to read through their proposals of the people who were contacting them. Of the sort of two or three hundred that have been sent through to them, 80% plus all were uh, just a generic document that had no tailoring. It never mentioned their company. It never mentioned them by first name. It was just a gold, silver, bronze. It never explained really how they were going to see a return on investment. Generic offerings do not work. I promise you they do not work. Don't send them. It's a waste of time and effort. Well, if you're going to send a proposal out to these people, make sure you name them by first name make sure you list their company name, and make sure you have a really clear reason why they should be part of your organization's event or annual partner. Because the clear reason is profit. How can they make more sales? How can they uh, sell more services? How can they get in front of your audience? And how can you enable this for them?
The clear reason is what's in it for them. It's not about your organization. It's about how you can get them in front of your audience. Now, brand exposure. Nobody wants it. I've got to tell you, in the last six years, I think I've had one corporate actually request, can you give us some brand exposure? Who doesn't know what a big red W stands for? Westpac kind of have this nailed. So when we're talking about brand exposure, it's not the thing you lead with, just like logo placement as the leading benefit. You have to lead with how you're going to return their profit. So you lead with things like we're able to research our members, our stakeholders. We're able to ask these questions through a survey monkey that then can save you money from your market research. We're able to engage with them face-to-face -face via our events. We have a monthly, a weekly, a bi-weekly, a bi-monthly newsletter that goes out, and we're able to engage you through there. And we have some hard copy publications. They're genuine reasons to get involved. And we don't talk about, we'll put your logo here and your logo there, because that's not the biggest benefit. You start with the research. You move on to the uh, events. Then you go through the publications, the electronic publications, and you talk about the fact that you've got someone to uh, give them a return on investment report at the end of each strategic phase. Now, on the uh, levels of annual partners, gold, silver, bronze, leave it to the events companies. Events, you can still run with this type of thing. But as an annual partner, where you're asking forty to 50000 and above, Really, it needs to be a tailored document on how you can actually engage them through the entire year, not a gold, silver, bronze. So on the proposals, what's hot right now, you, it literally is exclusivity. Exclusivity is being asked every single time. Now, because of that, we dictate the parameters of the exclusivity. So what I mean by this is, if you're talking to Westpac or NAB or one of the banks, we would give them the exclusivity as a high street bank exclusivity. The reason for this is we still want to be able to have investment banks. We still want to be able to have credit card companies, and we still want to be able to have merchant card facilities. And the high street banks can't offer enough income for anyone to offer them a complete exclusivity over financial products. So you dictate the parameters of the exclusivity, and this way you're able to have upwards of 20 to 25 exclusive annual partners at, say, 40 to 50,000 each and still manage them easily. That way they can have their exclusivity, they'll be comfortable with it, and you can still manage the uh, interactions and the servicing. Social media and mobile apps. Now, mobile apps are coming up strong now. If you've got a mobile app that engages with a hard-to-reach community of stakeholders, uh, be that seniors, be it homeless, women in crisis, whatever it may be, then the mobile app is proving to be really positive in the way that it's GPS enabled. So if you're in Sydney, we can have advertising within the app within Sydney you walk around to Campbelltown, and now we can have some local advertising there. You go to Melbourne, we can have a different advertising there. The GPS enablement has meant that we can really ramp up the amount of engagement through that mobile app. Social media within an annual partnership is no longer a nice-to-have. It's a must-have. The number of uh, corporates who are going out and looking for partners and in their clauses are saying you must have social media is going through the roof. It's going to be within a couple of years absolutely a necessity. I would say if you don't have a social media presence, get one. You're going to lose out without it. Um, the clear measurement strategies, well, when it comes to the measurement strategies, you dictate how they're measured. We're seeing the time and time again that we're sending out these offers to our stakeholders and we're not measuring how many take them up. The most straightforward way there is if you're pulling an offer out to your stakeholders, ask them to contact you for an exclusive membership code 
to enable them to take a part of that benefit. This way you can measure how many have engaged with you. This allows you then to go back to your partner and your corporate and say, we had this many people engage with us to take this on. And that way you can measure the amount of engagement and how many people are getting involved. When it comes to uh, what the corporates are looking for, they're looking for creative engagement. Now, when we talk about what is a creative engagement, these are events that aren't just straightforward I'm going to stick four people on the stage in front of an audience, two in the morning, two in the afternoon, and call it a one-day conference. What we're talking about is how can we engage the corporates within that event? How can we engage the corporates throughout the entire year? Are we able to actually have them write a column in your newsletter? And are we able to call that column the industry's point of view and then have them ask some questions that then can be answered throughout the next one. It's when we talk about engagement strategies, it's how we can involve the corporates in our daily lives and get them engaged with our stakeholders. That's what they want. They want this face-to-face -face connectivity and they want to be involved with your organization. The, the more unique, the more creative, the more excited they get over this. And ambassadors. We're now seeing more and more people use the ambassadors as a really great way of getting that media cut through. So if you look at someone like Swiss Multivitamins, they have 20 to 30 ambassadors in every different sport, in every different TV, and it just means they're now relevant to a whole raft of audiences. So if you're looking at mental health now, and you're looking at the youth mental health with someone like... Um, the Headspace organization, they have Ruby Rose. Now Ruby Rose is a MTV DJ, a fashion designer. She is a beautiful young lady who, with mental health issues who goes out and talks to the youth on their behalf. That as an ambassador is a perfect representative. What we don't want is just I have the uh, Governor General and every year they send her a bottle of wine which you raffle off. That's not ambassador. What we want is your ambassador to talk to your stakeholders. We want the ambassador to be relevant to your organization, and we want them to be able to talk about your organization in circles that you don't talk in, in the media, in the radio, and wherever it may be. An ambassador is someone who goes out and champions your cause on your behalf, and they're really great for the not-for-profits. It also makes you much more attractive to sponsors if you have a nice high-profile ambassador. And as a side note to that, we don't pay ambassadors. Ambassadors that ask for payment aren't ambassadors, they're employees. So ambassadors uh, have to have a real good buy-in and believe in your organization. Now this brings us neatly to question two. So Sakine is going to uh, launch another poll that we can ask that, and tick all the boxes that apply. So the poll would be about the, would you accept fizzy drink producers? So this is Coca-Cola, it's Red Bull and Pepsi. Firearms, you know, would you take a rifle manufacturer? And when we talk about pharmaceuticals, if you're in mental health, the only two opportunities for mental health are cognitive therapy and pharmaceuticals. Are you going to cut out 50% of the entire industry? The poll is launched, so uh, Julian. Okay. Uh, so far, we have about 40% who have voted. Okay, you are the 40%. We need you to answer these polls and not answer your emails instead got to love webinars. It doesn't mean that you can get two or three things done at once. <laughs> How are we doing on the numbers, Sakina? So we have about 75%. Um, I'll just give them a couple of more seconds and then I'll Not close enough. the poll. Okay. 
So uh, about 39% have said uh, firearms and 39% have said tobacco and alcohol. 4% each have said fizzy drinks and coal, seam gas and mining and 13% have said pharmaceuticals. That's great. And I absolutely agree 100% with everyone who said they're not going to take tobacco. We just recently had a, uh, a Lung Health Foundation offered $10 million by uh, British American Tobacco to find the cure. How can you do such things? And fortunately, you just stand to lose all credibility. However, when it comes to firearms, we now have an environmental company using firearms in a pig cull. And that firearm is designed so that it's, it, even the, the firearm itself is called the pig buster rifle. When you have one million pigs living on Cape York, with only 19,000 humans living on Cape York, it means they're causing utter devastation. So for the first time, Browning and Winchester are now tools of the trade for the environmental side of uh, industry. And so they've come on to sponsor and support this pig cull that then saves the turtles from extinction. So what we must think about when we're working out who we accept on sponsorship, what will be the impact on our brand? And how will it be perceived when in the outside side of things? So I absolutely agree on tobacco. Pharmaceuticals, again, cognitive therapy, there is no sponsorship for cognitive therapy. When it comes to pharmaceuticals, there's a huge amount. And we have to balance out what we, how we take them on, especially with pharmaceuticals. I would say never take the product, but to take a brand is not so bad. Obviously, sit down with everyone involved and work through uh, which is the best for your organization. So that brings us neatly on to who was spending in 2013 and who's carrying on into 2014. So on the air travel, I hope you got your pens handy. The, what I'm just going to do here is run through my experience of 2013 and what's now carrying through. So Qantas closed their books. The moment that uh, Mr. Joyce decided to go, okay, we can't do this and we need government assistance and so forth, they closed their books. They're just beginning to open again, so they will entertain some small things like if you're bringing some celebrity from overseas. Do you have the option of taking a group of 200 or more out of state, in fact, out of state over to New Zealand? instead, because if you do, Air New Zealand want to meet you. Now, the Emirates and Cathay Pacific are very different. Emirates Airline, they're looking to get involved in a range of things, mainly families and mainly healthy outdoor activities. Cathay Pacific, I think they're beginning to entertain almost anything, as long as it includes some element of outdoor travel. Cafe Pacific really seem to be the big partners in this space at the moment. So do keep in mind, Air New Zealand for moving people across there, so if you want uh, free travel to uh, uh, take people overseas, Air New Zealand's awesome. Emirates are looking for the families and Cafe Pacific are looking for the travel side of things. They're both wonderful to work with. I would avoid at all costs Tiger. And Virgin, well, pers I've heard people have had good experience with them. I personally have never done that. So I can't talk from experience. It's from my side of things, I've never had a success with Virgin. So be careful there. On the tech companies, Hewlett Packard are looking now for big infrastructure builds. If you're looking at joining up states, if you're looking at joining up hospitals, if you're looking at joining up uh, centers in big infrastructure, Hewlett Packard are the people. If you work rurally and in the rural communities in over a wide area, 
outside the metropolitan areas, Motorola wants to speak with you. Motorola have a new two-way radio that uh, they're bringing in as a low-cost option. However, they're not getting the cut through they want. So they want to meet the rural engagement people in the outside areas there. So speak with Motorola. It's a beautiful product, and it's an, a nice price. So what they want to do is give you some of these so that you can uh, use them in your rural engagement, and they want to pay you some money and actually get you engaged on that side of things. Google are looking for big challenges. Do you have a big challenge? And by a big challenge, I'm talking driverless cars. I'm talking, uh, you know, internet in the reaches of the far deep whoop whoop. It's, you know, Google want a big challenge. And they want to do it if it's included with some sort of mapping. So GIS mapping, global map, the whole thing. Google, that's what Google are after. Samsung and Asus, they're after the female youth market. Now, Samsung and Asus are after the female youth market, but the Samsung are after the uh, higher end of things. So the, uh, I guess, mobile technology, whereas Asus are after flat panel. Now, Apple, Apple just don't sponsor. Apple may do one or two engagements if you're the deaf community because they're currently looking to engage there. But apart from that, you know, Apple really don't sponsor. On the electronics, what you'll find now is Sony and Bose are looking for uh, Bluetooth audio. So if you have outdoors, if you have, um, again, the family side of things, Sony and Bose. LG, Samsung, and Panasonic big screen TVs. We've got the World Cup on now. We've got the uh, big Commonwealth Games coming up. LG, Samsung, Panasonic, all looking to get big screen technology into the family household or into public en environments. If so if you have theme parks, if you have uh, any public space where they can use signage, big screen technology. And JVC, they're looking for broadcast technology. Do you know anyone who wants to or has a requirement for video? So if you've got a youth engagement and the youth are looking to make video and they're looking to do all these different creative uh, sort of art side of things, JVC are the people to go to. They'll not only give you products, but they'll even support your marketing cause and then give you income as well. Coffee is a very new one, and one that I have to say I'm a, a proud user of. So Nespresso are looking to get in front of uh, office buildings. And so rather than the home where they've already cracked that market, they're looking to now get into uh, offices and with their machines. So if you've got events, and rather than having a, a coffee company there, stick some, get Nespresso on board and let them just put 40 or 50 machines around your event, and everyone helps themselves. And then they run competitions where you can win one and take it home. They also spend money to help you promote those sort of events. Philips, again, is a machine manufacturer. So they're looking for the uh, higher end, where Nespresso is a few hundred bucks. Philips, we're talking a few thousand. So they're looking for the people who want their coffee ground, squashed, and delivered all by a machine. So they're looking for families, particularly mothers. Now, if you can access the mothers of any family, that's where Philips want to be. And when we're talking about your events again, Merlot and Vittoria. Now, it's not going to be an income generator, but it will be a cost remover. What they'll do is they'll bring along their uh, coffee and they'll supply the beverages for your event so that you can have a coffee place so if you have a exhibition and a quiet spot in your exhibition, stick someone like Merlot or Victoria, and then suddenly it becomes a very busy area of your exhibition. And Breville, once again, they're nice mid-range uh, coffee manufacturer machines, and they're after the family. On the health. Now, this is an interesting one. When uh, 
health and the first name on the health slide is Coca-Cola. I haven't gone mad. Well, I always have been, but maybe not in this case. Um, when you look at health, think water for Coca-Cola. Australia is the first country in the world to hit the 50-50 split for water and fizzy pop. Now, you can't take Coca-Cola as an, a brand if you're looking at health. However, you could take Never Fail or Mount Franklin. Now, they want water. When we talk about the water, what we're talking about is how they engage with your audience, with your stakeholders. So are you talking about water monitoring? Are you talking about water filtration? Are you talking about uh, sediment going out into the ocean? Coca-Cola wants water engagement. Is your event on a boat? Is it beside a river? Coca-Cola wants that water engagement. So if you're talking about health, if you're talking about engagement, and it's anything to do with water, apply to Never Fail and the Mount Franklin brand. On the flip side of this, if you have access to the medical community and that medical community are happy to engage with a complementary healthcare provider, we go to Blackmores. Blackmores have proven efficacy. They run it through uh, double blind uh, standards. They have all that and what they're trying to do is engage with that medical community uh, side of the community. And so on the flip side of that one, of course, we now have Swiss. Swiss want households. They want households, they want uh, the mothers, the head of the household, and they want engagement with families who buy their products. So when you're looking at someone like the youth market and the ones who like to go to the gym and are much healthier than most of us, they would, you would be engaging with GNC. GNC are the uh, supplement providers for protein powders and this type of thing and they want that youth market. Nature's Way is an interesting one. They're coming up at the moment in the health industry, but they're after uh, the children. Now, I don't know how much I'm comfortable with Nature's Way of strategy. It tends to be along those chewable, uh, gummy type of uh, multivitamins. Um, not sure if that's strictly the healthiest option, but they're after the children. They're very keen to promote that product and their brand. And Nike, if you have the health community, so if you have uh, the fitness people, and by this I'm looking at getting technology into running, technology into weightlifting, technology into health, and this is where Nike is. So the in uh, runner technology, the wristband technology, the wearable health technology, that's Nike. So keep those in mind. And each one of them is spending in the region of sort of 40 to 60,000 on an annual partnership at the moment. So a very buoyant market in Australia. Car manufacturers, you can see immediately they're split into some very clearly defined areas. If you have a uh, executive or aging population, Lexus, BMW, Mercedes, Audi, Land Rover want access to them. They're fighting over the access. And to give you an idea, Lexus are looking for more of a new executive. Mercedes are looking for the older executives, so leadership. Audi are looking for more of your uh, kind of, I guess, they believe academia side of things, so your architects, that type. And Lexus, well, they want to just buy their way into the prestige market. So they're all looking to get hold of that higher end. Whereas if you have um, new families, if you have schools, if you have education, what we should be looking at is Mitsubishi and Hyundai for their people carriers. And they want to get in front of anyone who's looking to get hold of that cost-sensitive or price-sensitive market. It would be either Hyundai or Mitsubishi, and it's always involved with their people carriers. They're rapidly taking over the market share, and they're doing this solely through the not-for-profit sector and getting engaged there. Honda is the unique one on this slide. What they do is 
they have quite a unique positioning within the motor industry. They not only have the cars, but they also have quad bikes. They also have marine engines. Then they have the uh, power uh, equipment, which is your hedge trimmers and your lawn mowers and this type of thing. So they have this wonderful range. So if you've got people going out onto the ocean, let's talk to Honda because they have the marine engines. If you've got people using quad bikes for rural engagement, let's talk to Honda because they're the biggest seller of those. And again, if you're using uh, anything to do with power equipment, Honda is relevant. Hard to engage with, very strict on how they engage. So put across a very clear, concise engagement strategy to Honda and get in front of them for about the $50,000 mark. So what's new in 2014? Well, 2014 has seen the uh, pearls come across. So Paspali, which is a wholly owned uh, Australian family company, and Callis now we're seeing really starting to spend to get hold of female executives. So if you have women who have careers and a professional career and you're able to engage with them, go to Paspali. They're spending hand over fist to get hold of these people and they do some wonderful engagement things where they give you some really beautiful pieces to offer at some of your events and they want to engage on a monthly basis with some sort of uh, strategy around your newsletter. And so they do very well. The watches, Chopard watches of Switzerland, the high-end watches market is now becoming really crowded. And we're seeing that the more names that come out, the more brands that come out are now just squeezing the margin. So you're seeing the higher ends of these watch manufacturers really push into new markets. And the way they're doing this is engage with the not-for-profits. So if you have uh, real estate agents, if you have um, senior citizens, if you have um, a clearly defined demographic like construction industry or so, there's a watch for that industry. Find out who it is. Offer them the opportunity to engage with your stakeholders through a raft of ways, and watches are proving to be really uh, a good one at the moment. Champagne. We spoke about alcohol before. However, champagne are proving really interesting. It turns out that in the world, uh, Australia has the fastest growing consumption of champagne. So once again, we're drinking more booze than anyone else. And uh, with the champagne, they've latched onto this. So where once it was always Verve and, you know, Lauren and uh, the kind of those sort of brands, what we now have is Laurent and Perrier, Paul Roger, the Cristal and Moon, they're all setting up marketing bureaus within Australia. Now, Laurent and Perrier, basically the way they work is they will take over all your food and beverage costs for your event. And the reason they do this is so that they can provide their champagne with matched food and it enhances their brand. Now this isn't going to make you much money, but what it will do is cost removal so you don't pay for the food and beverage. But on top of this, it makes you get more bums on seats to your event. Because if you can be supported by the champagne brand, it will be a case of everyone who turns up gets a glass or two or three or four in some cases of this and they all go away having a wonderful experience. And Laurent and Perrier brand now is growing faster than any brand of champagne in Australia simply because of their engagement with a not-for-profit. We're seeing them everywhere and they're really, really benefiting from getting in front of them. Now, the most common comments I get back from this is, our people don't drink champagne. I think you'll be surprised. I really do. I think you'll be surprised just how many people drink champagne. It's mind-blowing. Paul Roger, totally understand. Ultra high-end, but if you have CEOs of the not-for-profits coming together, go to Paul. And Moom, well, they're looking for the outdoor lifestyle. So they have horse racing. If you have a sporting in, uh, industry, you go to Mum. And firearms, because of their recent 
uh, success within the uh, not-for-profit area, within the environmental area, they're now out looking for their next people they would like to engage with. So if you have a pest issue that can only be resolved with a cull, then this is who you would go to. And firearms are looking to become that area. So in more rural communities, because most of them already have a firearms side of things, but if you have the ability, the income that you can generate from this is quite large. The, uh, when you look at what we did in uh, North Queensland, you, you're talking about six-figure sums here. And it's really interesting on just the experience they had to now wanting to re-engage with the not-for-profit community. So what are we seeing now? Exclusivity is everything. When you go out to these organizations, offer them what the term I like to use as industry exclusivity. They will be the exclusive partner for their industry. You set the parameters. Clearly define those parameters. So if you talk about credit card, is it a uh, Visa or a MasterCard? Is it Diners Club? Is it American Express? And they'll have exclusivity within that credit card. They don't get exclusivity on the merchant facility. You can now approach someone extra for this. They don't ex get exclusivity for loyalty cards. There's someone else there. You set the parameters and you go forwards with them so they understand that you're able to take on other industries as well. Co-branding. I think this is going to be driven, it's early days, but I'm seeing more and more requests for co-branding. So if you take on a water manufacturer, are you able to have a label put on there that has their name plus your area? So for instance, if we were talking about a football club, and the football club has uh, Mount Franklin, are we then able to put the football club's logo onto the Mount Franklin bottle to co-brand that bottle? So Mount Franklin is seen as a supporter of that club. Co-branding is a two-way split of an organization's income, and it's proving to be really cost-effective for the partners and the corporates involved. And what we're seeing is it offsets some of their costs, so they're willing to actually in, put in more money because there's a three-way split go on. If you're able to bring on two partners for the same product, co-branding is the way to go. And inclusions, inclusions are a beautiful term. It, it basically means once they are now coming on as your partner, how are they then able to actually in, make themselves more attractive to your brand? Because what we need is a three-way split. You have to win. The sponsor has to pay you. They have to win. They have to get a return on investment. But what are we doing for our stakeholders? and now members. How, how do we uh, put something in there for them? So what's the inclusion that we'll put through and the benefits to our stakeholders? It's no good just exposing these brands and their products and their services to your stakeholders. We have to give something back. So if we start talking about uh, a, an example, something like uh, Avis Car Hire, you know, what we would have to do there would be we get paid, they get the return on investment, but all our stakeholders now get, because they're our stakeholders, because they're involved with us, they would get a crazy preferential rate on one particular uh, type of hire vehicle. And that means that now they can't get that anywhere else. So suddenly Avis gets huge amounts of hires from your organization. It's easily measurable and everyone benefits. So make sure there's an inclusion for your stakeholders. You want that three-way win. You don't want just the, the two wins going on. Inclusions are becoming very, very important to actually get that engagement and get the measurability go through. So that brings us neatly to the 45-minute mark. And is there anyone who has any questions? Thank you, Julian, for the presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, this first one is from Ray. 
what is the best way to research for different sponsors and who is looking to sponsor someone? Oh, it's a really tough question, Ray. The only reason I know this is because every uh, client I work with, we approach 40 sponsors. And of course, we get 40 replies back. So I keep up to date on, almost on a daily basis of who wants what and how. The best way to research, I find, is to go to their annual, uh, or sorry, go to their website. At the bottom of the website uh, is to click a tiny lettering, and often colored the same as the background, but the word sitemap. When you click the word sitemap, what will happen is it will now change the entire website to a, a straightforward formatted structure. And you were looking for the annual report. Now, the annual report will be in the PDF format. So when you get the annual report, open it up and look for the term. Well, the first term to look for is consolidation. If you find out they're in a consolidation year, they have no budget. You don't need to look any further. If they're in an expansion year, find out what they're expanding into with what products and what markets because they'll always list it because it's a report to the uh, stakeholders. Once you know what they're expanding with, what products and what services into what markets, it also it tends to be a nice rule of thumb that whatever the numbers they talk about, about 5% of that turnover will be allocated to marketing. So now you know the marketing spend that they're going to allocate to that expansion and that growth. The great thing about the annual reports is they also dictate who's going to head it up, and they give you the name of the person. So now you have the name of the person, the name of the company, and you have what they're expanding in and a rough idea of what they're spending on their marketing. So you go then to Google, and you type in the company, then you go minus star dot star. You go space, quotation marks, the person's name, close quotation. And then you go space plus tell plus email. And that will return back all the information for that person within that organization. Now you'll have the direct dial telephone number and direct email address. And now you can contact them directly with a proposal written around what they uh, stand to achieve from engaging with you specifically for their engagement strategy so that they're much more likely to partner with you on that expansion. So the best piece of advice is download the annual reports and have a read through. Great. Uh, this is going back, is to, going back to the slide of which not-for-profit sectors are hot now. And here is a question from Stephen. Uh, how do the arts sector figure in this? What are the uh, trends, insights, etc.? I, 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 now, the art sector is a really challenging sector, Stephen. It really is. So what we have to do is we can't just use the broad arts. We have to know, are you video arts? Are you engaging in uh, the live performance? Is it then paint? What type of art and what type of community are you accessing? So be very, very clear if you have for instance, uh, a disabled community being involved in engagement with the arts, you lead with the fact of this is the community and this is what the arts are returning back to that community. It's not the arts sector you lead with. Arts really struggle in Australia and I really, really struggle. So we have to lead with the community you're engaging within the arts. Then we have to describe what type of arts it is they're engaging with, and then we have to show clear outcomes of what it does for that community. Now, it's the community that you engage with and the outcomes that dictate who you would go for. So an example of that would be if we spoke about a disabled community engaging making videos uh, as a form of uh, video art, now what we have is uh, the equipment a disabled community would require, lifts, wheelchairs, um, catheters, these types of things. And we also have 
the videography side of things, JVC, Panasonic, and Sony, to actually assist them. On, and we should chuck Canon and Nikon in there as well, and GoPro. Um, and each of those, then we work out how much value they stand to make from this. So if it's a small community group of disabled getting involved in the arts, now what we're talking is maybe 15, 20 people engaging. Who's going to see the outcome? Who's going to see the video? Because suddenly your value has just gone up. So once again, I would be looking for about $40,000 a year for something like I just explained. And I would break that down to maybe two or three as a maximum partner. I hope that helps. I can't see the questions, so I, I do apologize. Is there any more questions, Vicky? Yes. Um, this was regarding um, who has been spending in 2013. So this is a question from Mary. Are you speaking towards engagement in Australia or also in New Zealand? This was in specific to health and coffee. Um, so I would say that uh, New Zealand market tends to follow the Australian market. So when we talk about the engagement, um, I, what I'm really talking about is engagement in Australia at the moment. However, working in New Zealand, what it tends to be is a change of pricing structure. So if you have uh, people flying across New Zealand, it's actually about the size and numbers from Australia. But if you're working within New Zealand, you need to treat New Zealand as a pricing structure for a single state. So if you're a national organization, but you're doing something within New Zealand, your pricing becomes relevant to a single state. So effectively, New Zealand is priced the same as New South Wales. Okay. Um, the sec this another question from Sarah is very similar to what you just answered, but in case if you wanted to add anything more, how similar or different is the New Zealand situation compared to Australia? Okay. So if uh, the pricing structure is the similar to that of a single state, what I'd also say is if you're within New Zealand and you're looking for partners, I would look outside of New Zealand. New Zealand really, really, really got hammered in the GFC. And it's just because of its creativity and the type of people who just do some amazing things there, it's bottomed out and now it's really on a growth pattern. What we're finding though is that the corporates don't see the value of the creativity within New Zealand. However, the states, Singapore and Australia do. So if you're looking to access corporate partnership from within New Zealand, go outside and work out how you can engage an organization to bring them into New Zealand. So it's proven to be very effective and you can access a whole community within New Zealand and take and be a single channel to market. Um, for accessing the corporates within New Zealand, it's bloody difficult. That's the truth. It's it's hard to do at the moment. Okay, another question here from Margot. We are a school PNC and we'd like to have a sponsor, but we are not sure what we'd have to offer them. We are a parent body of about 500 and we would like to gain sponsorship for our annual weekend working bee. Okay, so PNCs unfortunately have come in for a real battering in the media recently what with New South Wales uh, uh, being taken to court and disbanded and state government coming in and so forth. So unfortunately, you have a perception challenge going on with PNCs at the moment. So what I would say is the first thing we have to do as a PNC is reassure corporates that they're engaging with a proactive group of people who are from a affluent school and they're looking to achieve a single outcome. And that outcome cannot be just to make money. The outcome must be work out what the school requires, get the school principal's buy-in, and then work out if it's going to be a new climbing frame, if it's a new swimming pool, if it's whatever that purchase will be, and then walk the corporate through how you're going to engage the corporate with the school community 
in what strategies you're going to use the corporate branding, the corporate staff, the corporate products and services, and how you show a clear return on investment for that corporate through that uh, working bee uh, engagement. Now, then once you've got that face-to-face -face engagement now, what sort of marketing are you going to do for that corporate to the extended community? Because you're only going to get a certain amount of the parents and citizens involved in that working bee. What about the others that aren't getting involved? So how would you contact the remaining parents? How would you get some sort of offer to the remaining parents to get involved with that corporate? And then once that working bee is done, how would you then extend the life of this by interviewing people and returning the uh, stories out to the email communication? The strategy for a PNC must be longevity. So we talk about how we can uh, engage with the wider community up front to get them to come and take part in this working bee. Then we talk about what we do across the live face-to-face -face event. And then we talk about post-event strategies. And there must be two or three engagement strategies for each of those three segments, the pre-event, the event, and the post-event. Once you have this, and you have the uh, support of the principal for that single goal, then we can start looking at who you should approach. So if you're talking about new playgrounds, we should be looking at shade sales. We should be looking at the Swedish companies who only make playground equipment and would like to use someone as a case study. So that's the way to go for a PNC. Okay, uh, I have four questions on my screen at this point and looking at the time I think we might just have time to address those four questions. Uh, so this is a question from Wendy. Okay. Hi, do you have any suggestions or advice in relation to determining if there is an ethical mission fit? I beg your pardon? Relation to the mining if there's a particular... Um, Sorry, I didn't catch the, the question. whole question, Sakina. Sorry, uh, do you have any suggestions or advice in relation to determining if there is an ethical mission fit? Ah, good question. <laughs> yes, there is an ethical challenge around mining. Um, where to begin? Big question. I would say, first things first, are you an environmental company? If you are, stay away. If you're not, then start looking into what the mining means to your industry, what it means to your organization, and how you can align with the mining in an area without uh, challenging uh, environmental issues. There is a definite ethical issue. Um, but what we have seen, if you look through the trends through the past, before mining, most environmental uh, areas really didn't like farming because farming deforested, plough fields, used chemicals, and which in turn when it rained ran off into the water systems and so the farmers were the bad guys. Since mining, we now see that mining are now the farmers have jumped on the bandwagon and everyone now says that mining were the bad guys because of the deforestation, the removal of the indigenous population, the uh, big holes that they build and the devastation effects they have on the landscape including heavy metal waters. Now since then we now have coal seam gas and coal seam gas with the pollution of water aquifers and the concerns there the, the, the access to private property and the, all the issues around there. So be aware of who you, you engage with and be aware of, the, of how that impacts your brand and the perception of the, uh, the general public of people who engage with those people. However, there's always the flip side. If you look at someone like BHP, their corporate social responsibility document means that they return 1% back to community groups each year. 
last year or a few years, sorry, a few years ago now, that 1% equaled $192 million. That's a lot of money and it's a lot of money to do a lot of good work with. So you do have uh, an ethical challenge there with, you know, how much great work could you achieve with a few hundred million and balanced off with if you don't engage with them, are you then able to deliver as much good work? And so yes, it's an ethical challenge and it, it's not one that I know the exact answer to, I'm afraid. It, it's totally individually based on who your organization is, what your organization does and who it engages with. I have another question here from Susan. We are, a, we are a state organization and part of a federal model, but we work individually and I'm looking for partnership with a Tasmanian office only. Should I look within Tasmania or will na national global brands be interested? We support family carers. Okay, so um, within Tasmania, you're going to have a challenge. Tasmania at the moment with the new government coming in and the way they campaigned about not-for-profits uh, wasting money is, has been really quite devastating for the not-for-profit community within Tasmania. So what I would say is lucky enough that uh, perception remained within the state. So outside the state, I would look first of all primarily within uh, the mainland Australia for the partnerships and offer them access to a really hard to reach demographic within the entire state. Then what I would do is look overseas and see what other countries are doing for the caring community there and see if any products or service providers within their annual reports are looking to expand into Australia and offer Tasmania as a great focus group to, and to establish a brand or a product or service or see whether it's correct for the uh, country as a whole. They would be the first two areas I would go as Tasmania. Uh, great, Julian. Uh, actually, that was our last question. Uh, besides that, we've, ha we've been having a lot of requests uh, about the formula that you had that you mentioned previously, and also um, specifically, what was the link to search the contact details via Google? So, uh, okay. would it be possible so if, sorry, if you could email that to me, and then I could include that in my follow-up email to everybody else? What we do have is a nice, easier way of doing this. So, if you go to YouTube, and under YouTube, you type in Google Tips and Tricks. And under Google Tips and Tricks, you'll find a thing there by PC with Kids. And within there, they'll take you through. It's a five to seven minute video. And they'll walk you through step by step on how to find the individuals and how to use Google really effectively. It's a great skill to have. And it's one of those things that will really stand you in good grounding to find the individuals on the Internet. The other thing, of course, is utilize LinkedIn. LinkedIn is also a great resource, so you understand who you're, com you're engaging with. But Google and, uh, sorry, YouTube and Google Tips and Tricks, that's the way to go. Wonderful, Julian. I did uh, type that out so that it's gone out to the entire audience. Uh, Fantastic. Well, we're almost, uh, not almost, but we've, uh, over time now. So any last few words from you, Julian? Um, be brave. Go out to 40 people with 40 tailored documents and follow them up until you have a yes or a no from each. By going out to 40 and being persistent, you'll get 12 meetings. Out of those 12 meetings, you'll win five to six partners. Persistence is key. And I would love to hear how everyone goes. So keep us all up to form the, your successes and thank you for taking your time out today. Thank you Julian and thank you each and every one of you who could join us today. You will be receiving an email shortly with the link to the recording and the slides. Uh, I hope you had a good session today. So until next time, thank you and bye-bye.